Welcome once again to the Benedictine Monastery of the Holy Cross, which is in Ross Trevor, County Down, Northern Ireland. The monastery itself is situated in a valley in the foothills of the Moorn Mountains. But we are at a very short distance from the Irish Sea. Carlingford Lock comes into Ross Trevor. And it happens sometimes when we have to go shopping or to do some errand that we drive along the seafront. And there are days when the sea is so tossed by the wind that it literally comes across the car. Yes, in all of our lives, there can be storm-tossed moments such as those we witness when we drive along the coast of the Irish Sea. Our hearts can become storm-tossed. Sometimes we find ourselves in really troubled waters, and this for multiple reasons. Where we would all like to be calm and tranquil, and there are days when I drive along that sea coast and the sea is like glass, where we would all like it to be like that all the time, that's not how it is. The winds rage and the waves rise and we can be storm-tossed as a result. Our hearts can become disturbed. Our lives can sometimes run out of control just as the car can go out of control when those waves hit it. We can be carried away by our passions, completely thrown by the way in which they surge up within us, taking us by surprise. Maybe it's the passion of anger that flares up in our hearts. Maybe it is a strong sexual passion which arises within us. Maybe it is a terrible fear that overcomes us. Or it could be vicious envy, a jealousy that devours us from inside, inhabits us at certain moments to an extent we never thought possible. Whatever the passion is that arises within us, we can be left feeling helpless as a result. We can be left feeling terribly exposed and be like those vulnerable travellers in a little boat on the high waves of a sea. Yes, storm stoss seas are not unknown to us. At times our inner peace is really severely disturbed. And when we find ourselves overwhelmed for whatever reason, it is important for us to remember what the Gospels have to teach us about living on storm-tossed waters because what the Gospels teach us can bring us great comfort. The call addressed to us when we feel terribly helpless is to come back to that essential truth told in the Gospel story where we see Jesus calming the waves. It is to pay heed to that call when he says to us that there is nothing to fear, that he is with us and that he comes to restore peace and bring about calm anew. That won't mean that we won't have been in some way disturbed by the storm. Yes, even when Jesus is there to protect us and bring us comfort in the midst of life storms, we can nonetheless feel troubled inside. But the Lord is there with us. He is there for us. Even when things seem to be completely out of control, he is in our little boat. Yes, he may be asleep, but he is there and we can call upon him to awaken and take care of us. Caught up in the storm, it isn't always easy for us to see that Jesus is there. It can happen that we feel so frightened by it all, so submerged by what's going on, that we forget the presence of the Master, just as the disciples had forgotten the presence of the Master until the going really became tough. And they cried out, Master, do you not care? We are going down. And sometimes our prayer is little more than that, to call it, Master, do you not care? Because it seems to us as if we're sinking. Of course, sometimes we are in peril and we don't see it. And it's about a time when one man was in peril and didn't see it, that I would like to pay a little attention at this point in our reflection. I would like to speak about the great King David. And I would like to refer to a story which we find in the second book of Samuel. David has been unfaithful. He has stolen another man's wife. And the prophet Nathan is sent to David to point out to him the error of his ways. It's as if David up until this point 
doesn't really get it when it comes to the harm that he has done around him. And so Nathan told David a story, a story that he hoped would touch the king's heart, and it did. I'll read the story. Nathan said to David, In the same town there were two men, one rich and one poor. The rich man had flocks and herds in great abundance. The poor man had nothing but a ewe lamb, only one, a small one that he had bought. This he fed, and it grew with him and his children, eating his bread, drinking from his cup, sleeping on his breast. It was like a daughter to him. When there came a traveller to stay, the rich man refused to take one of his own flock or herd to provide for the wayfarer who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. When David heard the story, David's anger flared up against that rich man. As the Lord lives, he said to Nathan, the man who did this deserves to die. He must be made pay fourfold restitution of the lamb for doing such a thing and showing no compassion. And then Nathan said to David, you are that man. And he helped David come to see that he was that man because he had taken another man's wife. He had stolen something that was precious to that poor man. And so I think what we see here is how Nathan was able to approach David and help him realise that something was terribly amiss in his life and that he was in total denial around it. He helped David come to acknowledge his wrongs and their consequences. And he did this by touching David's emotions. Yes, that's how Nathan was able to, as it were, get in there and help David recognise what wrong he had done. It wasn't by denouncing the wrongdoing in a violent way. His goal was to help David come to a realisation. And so he went about things with a certain human wisdom. One cannot but be struck by Nathan's approach. Nathan used a story to broach the topic of David's wrongdoing. And he managed in this way to make contact with David. He managed in this way to get him, as it were, emotionally involved. He managed to help David see the injustice of his actions. Nathan managed to bring David beyond his denial, his rationalization of things. Now, denial is something that we all give in to at times. I have an American Franciscan friend who says, denial is not just a river in Egypt, it runs through each one of us. And I think he makes a very important point. One of the ways in which we deny our sinfulness is to rationalise them, to excuse the things that we've done wrong. That's a defence mechanism that we can all resort to. And it's a defence mechanism that locks us into our guilt because it hinders us from acknowledging our responsibility, which is the first thing we need to acknowledge if we're to correct what has gone wrong and make amends in our lives. Like David, remember in the story, he was ready to recognize the rich man's fault and wanted him to pay fourfold restitution. Like David, we can all be prompt to recognize others' wrongs and be very committed to making them correct them and yet be blind to our own wrongs, be totally in denial around our own misbehaviours. We can become outraged while still avoiding to make truthful amend within ourselves. We all ask questions like this when something terrible happens in the world. How could anyone do such a thing? How is it that anyone could have committed such a crime? Let's never forget that all of us could do such things as the things we condemn such crimes that we find to be totally abhorrent, they are within all of us a possibility. Often those who feign outrage most or those who actually genuinely feel it most when they see some wrong committed are blind, oblivious to their own wrongdoing, even in the same domain which they criticise others for. Nathan's words to David have a very poignant ring to them. And it's important for us to hear them as addressed to us. You are that man. You are that woman. 
We can all get things wrong like David and be blind to it. And we need to have people who actually point out to us what needs to be corrected in our lives. That's something that happens, for example, in a married couple where the spouse can point out to another what he or she is blind to. It's something that we can do in friendship. It's something we are called to do in community. We are called to live a certain mutual correction. And we are called, of course, as Christians, to live mutual obedience, to listen to each other when people point out to us what is wrong in our lives. Nathan's piercing declaration, you are that man, helped David recognise and acknowledge his sin and its serious nature and it brought David to repentance. Nathan's intervention serves as a model for us, a reminder to us of our responsibility to look after our neighbours. One of the Desert Fathers points out to us that the life and the death of our neighbour is within our grasp. It's in our hands. We help others live, but we can also be responsible for their death if we don't point out to them the danger of the situation in which they find themselves. We all need to be confronted for our wrongdoings in order to be helped to move beyond them. Nathan shows himself a wise prophet, a wise spokesman for God. He brought to David's attention the terrible reality of his sin in a way that David could listen to, in a way that opened up David to hope, the hope of forgiveness and salvation, the possibility of correction, the possibility of being able to make things right. David was able to receive what Nathan had to say because what Nathan offered was not just a blanket condemnation, it was a word that gave a hope of salvation. And that's always what God's prophetic word does. It gives us the hope of salvation. It is never a totally damning condemnation. Yes, it challenges us, but it challenges us to change, to change for the better. It never just condemns us to death and leaves us at our worst. And so may the word of God that we have listened to today, even as we go through the storm-tossed moments of our lives, and like David, things run out of control and we behave in ways that are not acceptable, may we be graced by God's word to find comfort and to find peace to be brought back to our true self. May we be graced to accept the correction others have to offer us. May we also have the courage when needed to point out to others the things that they need to have pointed out to them so that they may come to new life through forgiveness. Lord, help us to allow ourselves to be corrected and help us to have a sense of responsibility and regard to our brothers and sisters where necessary, pointing out to them what they need to have revealed to them. Amen. So live in a, a media age, of course, uh, an age in which we get almost all of our information either from television or from the internet. Probably less and less of our information is coming through the traditional print media. So in that context, in today's world, uh, an undertaking like Shalom World is incredibly important. And uh, the efforts to catechize and to evangelize uh, through television and through the internet is incredibly important in the world today. And I'm happy to say that my experience is of Shalom has been entirely positive and I am very happy to encourage everyone who's working 
as part of Shalom World in their efforts to bring the Catholic faith to the world around us. And also I give my special blessing uh, on all those who are involved in Shalom, all those who are watching Shalom, and all the future viewers of Shalom. So thank you and God bless you.